Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley and I'm the Vice President of Media Operations here at FreightWaves and we are excited to present today's webinar in partnership with Transflow. Today we're going to be hearing from two industry veterans who will be sharing how the freight recession has impacted the broker market. First, we'll hear from Donnie Gilbert, Director of Customer Experience for FreightWaves, who will be sharing an overview of the freight industry and what it means for the broker market. And then we'll hear from Doug Schreier, Vice President of Product and Innovation for Transflow, who will be providing insights into how they've seen the industry evolve in light of the changes leading up to this point. Following the presentations, we'll also have a live Q&A with our speakers to take questions from those of you who are listening in today. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have any technical issues or questions throughout the webinar, please click the chat button in your Zoom control panel and we will assist you there. And second, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our speakers during the live audience Q&A following the presentations, please click that Q&A icon in your control panel to enter those and we'll answer as many as we have time for at the conclusion of the presentation. At this point, I'd like to first turn it over to Donnie Gilbert. So welcome, Donnie. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Mary Ann. So today I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of insight on what's been going on in the market uh, here in the past few months. We're going to look at volumes, start with national volumes, and kind of look at drive-in volumes, and work our way into uh, what's going on with the current rates. So looking at national volumes here, I've brought one of our charts from, from Sonar. And uh, we're looking here at a... Um, a map here that shows on the right hand side our outbound tender volume index and of course on the x-axis on the bottom we have our dates you no know, starting out here about the first of april all the way through uh, our current uh, the first week of november and what we're looking at here is in the blue line is 2019 volumes and in the orange line here are the volumes that we're comparing to 2018. and here back in july we see uh, right around in here in july about i think it's july 22nd um, we see where outbound tender volumes of 2019 actually crossed up and became uh, greater than the volumes from 2018. Donnie, let's step in real close to that mic. We've got some people saying it's hard to hear you. All right. And so what we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at volumes, and I'm separating volumes from rates right now. I want to look at volumes first and look at volumes by themselves because volumes tell quite a different story uh, than what's going on in the, in the world of rates. So we're looking at this uh, chart here, and we've got on the right-hand side our index points uh, of what's been going on with both 2018, which is in the orange, and the volumes from 2019, which is in the, the current volumes in the blue line. We're looking here back at July, about 22nd, and we see where the volumes from 2019 actually crossed over higher than the volumes that have been going on in 2019. So for pretty much over the last three months, we've had a lot of growth over 2018, which is really important and shows actually a lot of strength in the markets of 2019 in terms of volume. Now we ended October with about a 1% growth over 2018. October saw some declines in volumes throughout 2019, but we also showed some uh, signs of a decline in 2018. So we still showed some growth in October uh, and it was positive growth uh, and we still outperformed October in terms of growth. Uh, we've seen really no significant increases in any of the markets across the U.S. in the past 30 days. Like I said, we've seen a lot of declines, uh, but we're still outgrowing, outpacing 2018. Now, here in the first week of November, and for the first time in a little bit over three and a half months, we saw where volumes for 2019 have dipped down about 2% under 2018, which is a little bit of a concern, but we still, we, you know, we still have relatively strong volumes that are going on right now. And as we enter this retail season, uh, that can quickly turn around. Uh, looking at drive-in tender rejection rates, or drive-in outbound tender volumes, uh, the demand's been, you know, really positive this year. It looks like we've been running about 5% over 2018 from, you know, July through September. And again, a lot of the market that we're looking at is, uh, you know, about 75%, 75% maybe 80% drive-in of the actual national markets. So when you're looking at the blue line here and looking at outbound tender volumes for the drive and you'll see it looks very similar to our national one. Uh, the trends continued into October. They weakened slightly. And of course, as we went through October again, we saw here near the end of October, the actual great decline that's you know, brought down and dipped below 2019, where in 2000, or dropped below 2018, where you see the green line is now 2018. 
they started to dip up here at the beginning of November. Um, there's some kind of some suspect, you know, due to the low low volumes or the low um, rates from the drive-in industry that some of the reefer van was converted. And, um, you know, so far right now, our overall uh, volumes are not, you know, quite as robust as we would like. Uh, looking in here, I want to bring forth something that's very interesting. Uh, we had, you know, kind of the tariff wars that started off in uh, late last year. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the uh, shipments that are uh, from the International Maritime uh, Customs data. And it's uh, basically it's the retail trade goods that are shipping over on the lane from China to the West Coast. And I'm comparing that with our Freitos Baltic Index, which is kind of the how the rates uh, went along with the shipments. And what's kind of really important to look at here, we see in July and here in the fall, where the, um, the volumes in blue here, they're actually starting to pick up. And this is a good indication that shows where when the volumes start to pick up, that tightens demand for shipments. And that was actually pushing the rates up for, your, um, for the container ships that are running from China over to the West Coast. And this is that pull forward. This is, the, this is the, the tariff scare that everybody was trying to get their shipments in. We saw it here right before the uh, retail season in 2018. And then, of course, we saw it bump up here at the beginning of 2019 again. So there's a lot of our uh, maritime uh, goods that were actually shipped a, real, shipped a little bit early. And this is where we see it in our data charts um, in early or late 2018 and late and early 2019. And as we see, as we get on down here into from September to November, you see these uh, volumes that are actually going into decline. And we're, uh, a lot of people were expecting this to kind of either stay even or start to pick up and maybe not realizing how much freight was actually previously moved and was actually ran into and stored in warehouses across the U.S. Looking at Southern California, uh, this is one of the biggest uh, port markets in the U.S. And it. Uh, the port markets are what drive the uh, markets across the U.S. for uh, in the trucking industry. So here we're looking at Ontario and Los Angeles. And uh, they've had some impressive uh, volumes this year. But here over the past uh, month, month and a half, we've seen these two markets go into a decline. Um, they were very active in the early part of 2019. And, of course, we saw where we had a lot of freight that was pulled forward. And that propped up the volumes out of these two markets. Uh, these this prop up in the volumes, it's probably more likely going to be absent when we get into early 2020, unless we have some, uh, some kind of other changes, uh, such as more tariff uh, scares that might cause another pull forward. But right now, uh, we saw that in early 2019. We're probably right now not going to see uh, any type of pull forward in, two, in 2020. And so our volumes have uh, greatly declined. Looking at capacity and rates. Um, I brought here a, a chart that uh, shows the uh, long haul, uh, that long haul average rates. And it's an average rate on several of our major lanes uh, that crisscross the US. And, it's, uh, and we're comparing that to our tender rejection rates that we use uh, here on our Freightways maps. Our tender rejection rates measure the willingness of carriers to pick up loads out of certain markets. And as you can see here, uh, it correlates very closely with what that shows as an average long haul rate. Uh, as uh, spot market rates tend to increase, uh, tender rejection rates uh, tend to jump tend to jump up, and as spot market rates decline, uh, tender rejection rates decline. So we've seen capacity; it's pretty well remained fairly loose through October. We had some slight disruptions uh, related to the Northwest area. We had you know apples coming to harvest, potatoes coming to our, into harvest. And for the most part, that area picked up, but a lot of the other uh, capacity across the U.S. Uh, remained fairly loose. Uh, our care acceptance rates have been in the 95% range. So here we show tender rejection rates right now, currently at 5.18%, which is very low right now. Uh, a little bit tighter in the spring, but not as tight as, you know, we had a little bit of a peak here in the summertime where rates rose near the end, end of June and kind of through the um, 4th of July season here. Uh, what we're expecting going forward is, you know, with only the small peak here for what we call during the produce season, um, it's kind of letting us know that with rejection rates this low, we're going to have probably a fairly weak fourth quarter in terms of rates. Uh, we've seen strong volume so far in the fourth quarter. We have seen them dip down, uh, but the spot market rates have not been that strong 
uh, this year, not as not nearly as high as they were compared to last year. So we've seen no visible signs that we're going to have a really strong. We're still going to have a small peak season for fourth quarter, but not anything like we've seen in the previous years. I brought today uh, the pricing power index, and this is a very strong uh, indication of what is going on uh, with who is actually controlling the markets and our. Freightways analysts have gone through, they've looked at tender rejection rates across the U.S., they've looked at capacity across the U.S., and they've looked at the volumes across the U.S., and they've come up with this, with this um, indicator on who is actually in control of the market. Now, right up here in the middle where it says the 50-50 the mark, that's right in between the carriers being in control on the right and the shippers being in control on the left. Uh, so 50, the 50 would be like a coin flip. But here you see the indicator is far to the left on shippers. And this could be related to both shippers and brokers. Uh, a broker that's actually trying to get power to cover, uh, cover their current loads, their dedicated loads, their contracted loads, they would be in terms in this category as a shipper. So what we're looking at here is shippers and brokers are strongly in control of the rates when it comes to uh, getting power to cover their loads. So when... Uh, Going forward right now, we expect to see this, the shippers being pretty well in control throughout the rest of the fourth quarter and probably through most of the first and second quarter of 2020. So when you're looking at the uh, stock market, guys, just remember as brokers, right now when you're finding power to cover your loads, you are getting in control of the rates. So do not let carriers run their rates up. You control the rates. Awesome. Thanks so much, Donnie. And now that we have an overview of the industry, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Doug Schreier, who is going to be addressing how this state of the industry relates to the battle of the broker we're experiencing and how companies can respond. Doug, great to have you here today. I will turn it over to you. Doug, Doug we might have you muted. About that, guys. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me now. Uh, thank you, Donnie, for giving us our overview of the market. Uh, my name is uh, Doug Schreier, and I oversee product and innovation for Transflow. You know, so Transflow is a leader in mobile telematics and business process automation in the transportation industry. Through our digital platform, we deliver real-time communications to hundreds of thousands of fleets, brokers, and professional drivers. At Transflow, I get to work you know, with many of our brokers and carriers daily on finding ways to accelerate their business and solve their problems. At Sorry to jump in here. Doug, will you speak up? We're getting some people saying they are not able to hear you very well. It still seems to be a little too low. All right. Hold on one second for me. How is that better? Much better. Okay, awesome. Sorry about that, guys. Thought we tested that earlier. Um, I'll kind of go back through who Transflow is. Um, so Transflow is a leader in mobile telematics and business process automation in the transportation industry. Through our digital platform, we deliver real-time communications to hundreds of thousands of fleets, brokers, and professional drivers. One of the things that I enjoy most about my job is the ability to work with our partners, our brokers, and our carriers on a daily basis, looking to accelerate their business and looking for really uh, resolution to many of their problems and solving their problems. Here at Transflow, we pride ourselves on being a problem solver to the industry and our many customers. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the battle of the brokers, how the freight recession has made an impact, and we'll focus mainly on the internal and external disruption that we have seen and that our customers have seen to that market. So both you know, the outside external disruption and the internal disruption of the industry impact us in an up market and especially in a freight recession. So it was good to see that Donnie says that we're seeing growth in volume um, and hopefully those rates do catch up. Um, but the question here is, has war been declared? And if so, what is it? Um, 
So as I come in here, there's a few questions that we hope to answer today. Uh, first, you know, all the money that's coming into the industry through the technology investments, what's at stake? Why is so much money coming in? And what are they ultimately going to win? You know, from a broker side, you know, where are you at with, you know, armoring yourself? Are you have ancient armor? Are you utilizing modern military technology in the space? You know, what does a traditional broker look like today? What do they need to look like tomorrow? And how do they stay relevant and compete? And then how are digital platforms changing the battleground? And how ultimately will you know, the, the brokers and 3PLs use them to continue to accelerate their business. So as we look at it, we look at what the battle of the broker really is. We first look at the 15,000 brokers that we see operating within the space. Some of these guys have a heavy reliance on manual and phone processes. Transfer helps them with that. We also see a lot of our customers that are on the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, where they've really adopted it and they, they use that to make a strategic differentiation with their business and to drive their business. The traditional broker or these 15,000 brokers that we, we're dealing with, they're 99% of the market. So all that tech money that's coming inside has made less than a 1% penetration. But it's there, it's worth talking about. And you know, when we look at it, we do believe that they'll gain a little bit more market share um, but we believe we can help the, the broker, the traditional broker, fight against that as well. So these guys are Uber Freight, Convoy, Amazon. You know, especially when you look at Uber Freight and Convoy and what they're able to do, uh, they're able to come in and buy market share, uh, haul that market share at no profit. Um, as long as they're gaining that market share and building their platform, um, they're, they're able to do that. So. We'll continue to see more and more of that, but eventually they will be asked to make some money. So what are the battlegrounds? Uh, a war is truly made up of a number of different battlegrounds. And we wanna talk about the battlegrounds that the brokers need to fight, right? So we classify these into two, both internal and external. Your internal are, are your people process and technology, right? And we'll get into the details around that. Your external are your carriers, drivers, shippers, and working with your technology providers. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about what it means to be um, successful in today's world and what you have to do or what we believe from what we've seen and best uh, with our customers, what's best practice. First is the people. You know, there, there's a shortage of brokers from what we're seeing. Um, the broker continues to gain more and more of the market share. So it's interesting, Freightways actually published an article earlier this year in which they talked about the fact that 23% of all loads were moved by either a 3PL or a freight broker, and that that was a five times growth since 2000. You know, analysts continue to expect to see this increase. And as you see this increase, some of the things that will impact you are gonna be a shortage of brokers. You know, you have your great people that help make you successful. Uh, people see that success and they want it and they go and try to hire your, your brokers. So there is a shortage. When you need to grow, you need to go find another broker. Can you find somebody else that's already qualified and ready to hit the floor running? If not, it comes into training, right? How do I bring in somebody that is a, uh, capable candidate and train them to be a broker within today's space. Uh, so a lot of this has to do with process and technology that we'll talk about. Um, but with that process and technology, you know, how quickly can you get them up to adding value to your organization? And then also, as you're thinking through that, what are the things that you're training them on that don't add value? And is there a way for you to automate that? And the last one, uh, is retention you know, of your human capital. You spend all this time and this money uh, retaining uh, these employees or hiring them and, and training them up. Uh, we're seeing up to a 50% turnover uh, within the industry. So what is a 50% turnover due to your business? It costs you a lot of money. Uh, it can you know, also drive further turnover. 
right? So main causes of turnover that we're seeing, you know, have to do with getting your employees to align with your organization, um, making sure that you're at the right pay level and that the they're paying being paid equivalent to what they would get paid if they went on and moved to work for one of your competitors. And also, you know, a lot of these organizations as a typical broker, when you look at the averages, has 10 or less employees, is actually showing a clear career path. So they come in and start working for a small brokerage, it's hard to show the fact that they can grow and, and get to that senior level that they want to. So they will jump ship to find better opportunities for growth. So that's people, you get the right people on board, that's your first battle. You get that, you'll win the war, right? So the next one, right, is process. Um, and there's a few things that we look at when we work with our, our customers and finding out what we can do to help them on this internal, um, this internal battlefield. Right, so the first one is identifying those things that are value added versus non value added. In order to do that, you have to first understand your processes. Um, and by you having uh, a clear understanding of how you want to operate your organization, it allows technology providers uh, to help you automate key things um, and accelerate those things that can't be automated. So, you know, for example, you know, how do you get your people focused on bringing more carriers into your network and keep them caught within your network uh, once they're there? You know, how do you help with freight matching and presenting freight opportunities to the carrier that's more likely to, to haul it and that's more likely once they haul that load to haul another load for you? Continue to acquire your business, right? So working with new shippers or working with the shippers you have to find more freight and then actively tracking and tracing uh, your freight. We know your shippers have expectations for you. You gotta know where that's at. That actively tracking and tracing your freight ultimately helps you do the things that you wanna do in maintaining that carrier within your network. The things that you know, potentially deduct from uh, adding values or, or what we perceive as time killers uh, within your organization beyond what we all deal with from time to time where we get emails we have to reply to that may not add values or or meetings that we have to go to that nothing gets solved. Um, there's kind of these things that are industry specific, right? So am I onboarding carriers and how do I do it? I probably in today's world don't need to do that in a manual fashion, uh, especially with these carriers continuing to change how they operate somebody that's insured today may not be insured tomorrow. How do you ensure that that freight you're giving, you're giving it to a quality candidate or quality uh, carrier? You know, number of phone calls for, for low tendering, um, you know, it's really important for you guys to, uh, or for the market to build relationship with their, with their carriers and, you know, being able to identify that carrier, make that phone call to the right person or email to that right person to tend to that load quicker is a key. Paperwork scanning or faxing is hard to say that I'm a full digital operation if I have somebody sitting in the office that's scanning in all the invoices and, and working uh, with paperwork within my operations. And then, of course, you know, in today's world, uh, there's not much need to do uh, manual check calls. So, you know, we have a solution there and a number of other providers have a solution there where that eliminates the need to do that non-value added work. So, and then finally, you need to arm yourself with technology internally. And this is really interesting because I think this has changed quickly um, as the money has came in and competition continues to be tough. Uh, we're seeing technology um, and business leaders uh, having to stay in front of all of this, which is becoming a very tough and daunting task. These leaders have to stay in front of all of this because ultimately they're being asked not to create a widget or a new tool, or something that saves me five minutes over here. They're being asked to transform their businesses and align with strategic priorities. A whole lot harder thing to do. And as they're doing that, it's not a matter of building your tools, it's a matter of which tool do you need and how does that help me, right? Um, you know, the tools that I buy, especially with all these startups coming into the organization, um, you, you look at these startups that might have a great use case 
and they're here today, gone tomorrow. Um, you know, some of them have been extremely successful, but you want to make sure that you have a long-term ally there. Um, the build versus buy. Um, there was a lot of building, you know, several years ago. There's still a lot of building today within the brokerage market, um, but there's a whole lot more product to buy out there, things that will help transform your organization and things that are not just a single use case, but more of a platform or a complete solution that will help you improve your margins as an organization. And ultimately, you know, we, we hear about this a lot. This is a big topic at a couple of conferences this year. Um, too many tools. Um, and you see this, especially in the app space. Uh, you have so many tools that are being offered to a carrier, to a driver, to a shipper, even to, to the brokers themselves, that people are getting an app VT. And I shouldn't have to use this app to do this one activity and go use another app to do the next activity, and then use this third app to do this third activity. It's very interesting. For those people that delete their apps, they average 5.8 days from the last time they use that app to the point of deletion. Not everyone deletes their app. A lot of apps stay out there in the wild, but if somebody is deleting, they get deleted pretty quick. Uh, so if you spend a lot of time there, you'll see that fatigue. Um, one of the key things that we do uh, with Transflow, we bring something specific with Transflow, is to bring a single app together that handles everybody within the supply chain and helps them all meet their, their objectives and to accelerate their business. And then ultimately the tools add value. Um, and value is all in regards to adoption, right? One of the key pieces that technology leader and a business leader needs to do today is not determine what the tools are, but ultimately determine how to optimize them and deploy them successfully within my fleet, uh, within my broker, uh, for my carrier, um, whomever I'm deploying for, but that's one of the key pieces. A lot of people go buy and invest heavily uh, within uh, their tools, but they don't invest heavily in the processes and the people capability around deploying those tools. So that's a key battleground for you guys to win. The next one is gonna be the battleground um, and we're going external here. So we're gonna start talking about the external aspect of here. Is a battleground of the carrier. Uh, we wanna arm them with tools to win. So the broker has a capability to arm the carriers that they're working with to be wildly successful in their goals as well. You know, as a broker, you're working to make yourself easy to work with. Um, you wanna focus on how you can increase your profits and how you can help others increase their profits as well. Um, platforms allow you to do that. And as we see it, there's really two sides of the platforms. There's the platforms that enable the broker and, and the current uh, companies out there, those 15,000 brokers. And then there are platforms that are out there that are meant to displace uh, the brokers. So, you know, you, you know, making sure that you're working with things that help you pick up your business, um, that help you automate uh, your workflow. If you're automating your workflow, you're providing them a solution, the carrier has to do less work. The carrier has to do less work and you're bringing more value to them. They're more likely to do another load uh, with them. And remember, you don't want a distinct app, right? We talked about app fatigue, uh, having your own app or having a distinct app out there that they have to download or get their drivers to download um, is a tough thing for them to do. And we've seen very low uh, app adoptions for people that are deploying that type of solution. Further, uh, cash flow is, you know, is king. Um, carriers aren't making money. Um, they're out of ammo, if you think of it in, in the form of a battle. They're out of ammo. Um, so how are you helping them you know, get the invoice and the information that you need to you know, build your shippers um, um, and get your cash so that they can be paid quicker? Are you providing them a quick pay option? And when they need cash, can they go to you um, to get you that cash that they need? So the next external battlefield is that of the driver. And a lot of brokers, when we, we start talking with them, you know, they know that the driver war is out there, that that battle exists. They talk about the carrier's fight to retain drivers. Um, 
But a lot of times the broker, especially a broker dealing with these smaller carriers can do a lot to help that carrier within this driver. The other thing that we hear frequently um, is from a driver's perspective, people think that the driver has a simple activity to do. Uh, it's tough because they're not home, but ultimately they're driving freight from point A to point B. But when you actually look at the activities that drivers are being asked to do, there's over 130 distinct activities. And by you providing them tools to be successful, they will ultimately be able to do their job easier, right? So provide them easy workflows for hauling. Provide them all the information you have in regards to the load to them so that they're not having questions and that they're not delayed calling the carrier asking questions and the carrier returning and calling you. You know, make it easier on the carrier, makes it easy on the driver, you know, and ultimately if the carrier believes that you're providing value for both, uh, they'll ultimately become stickier. You know, and ultimately, you know, the turnover there um, is a key turnover issue. Um, if you help them with that frontline battle, it help you win your battleground as well. Uh, the next one is a shipper, you know, continues to grow um, in the, the expectation here, right? So I've heard people call it the Amazon service effect, um, you know, but ultimately, you know, we have to keep the shipper happy. Shippers being asked to provide information to their buyers and a broker, their carrier, their driver are key fronts to get them that information. So, they also expect it to get there sooner. So service expectation and you being able to find a carrier and a driver to do it is very key. Communication and providing that real-time visibility. And it's not just real-time visibility about where the freight is, it's also real-time visibility in regards to, you know, the, the activities that have been completed. Are they arrived? Is there a potential detention on that load? Um, you know, are they loaded out? you know, when's the ETA versus, you know, are they gonna hit a service window? That visibility is a key uh, component for them. And then how do they get clean invoicing up? Uh, you know, how do they ensure that they pay the brokers successfully? And that's something that we, of course, with our uh, history help a lot of people with. And the last one uh, that we're gonna cover for today um, is technology providers. And arming yourself with the right tool starts with the technology you choose internally and how you deploy it internally. But you also have to choose the right provider as well. Um, you know, so what are the key areas that you need to do when choosing the right uh, provider? Um, you need to manage the relationship, right? Uh, there's an internal relationship of deployment and there's an external relationship of optimizing um, your technology providers. So, you know, where's their funding coming from? Are they at startup status? You know, are they gonna be around next year? Are they gonna change their, their vision or their strategy? You know, how frequently are they gonna change their pricing and what you pay per load? And what's the impact to your, uh, you know, organization's cost structure? You know, are they gonna be a true partner? And there's a lot about this. If, if you go to CIO Magazine, or you spend any time looking at technology and what the difference between a vendor and a partner is, a true partner is gonna be somebody that listens to you. They're gonna understand your problems, they're gonna to work to find solutions, and they're gonna work with you to co-develop solutions that fixes your needs. Um, a vendor is one that will sell you software, they may answer the support line, but once they sold it to you and you're paying them, um, They'll be back around whenever that renewal period is. And those are vendors that you don't need. Um, those are vendors that ultimately um, aren't going to continue to evolve for you know, your solution, aren't going to continue to understand your problems, and, and you're really looking to get as many partners as you can uh, within them. And then you want them to have that collaborative build process. If you have a need, even if they haven't thought of it before, you want the ability to go to them, present that, the need, and have them work with you uh, day in and day out. So as we go through this, um, and you've optimized your acceptance and adoption, you've had these uh, battlefields that you're ultimately fighting, um, 
you're able to win the war. And we believe our goal here is to work with all of our customers in any war, any battlefield that they, they do, uh, to go in there, understand it, and ultimately fight uh, to win uh, and, and help you be that problem solver you need to be. So uh, I think we're at the point today uh, that we're gonna be going over questions and ultimately too, uh, we'll be at Freight Waves next week. I'm at booth 28 if you wanna talk to me further and uh, you don't have a question for me today. Awesome, thanks so much, Doug. Um, as he mentioned, we are gonna roll right into the audience Q&A session. So if you have not already submitted your questions for Doug and Donnie, you can do that through the Q&A icon in your control panel. First question here for you, Donnie. We've had some questions about the data that you were discussing. Tell us a little bit about where that comes from, what the Sonar platform is, just for context for those listening in. All right, so let's start off with, you know, more or less, you know, what is Sonar? And that's a, that's a very uh, long answer. I'm going to keep it kind of short here. But, you know, Sonar is a platform that we use that, you know, helps us predict what is going on in the freight markets. It's an ag aggregate collection of, a, you know, over 10,000 different data points that we've put together into usable information. Uh, we, we can view this on a U.S. map. We have 135 different markets. Uh, we put this uh, data into charts, we have heat maps, and uh, tree maps that we can view all this information on in a lot of different, in different ways. Uh, we have data that uh, pertains to air freight data, maritime data. Of course, we have what I use in the brokerage market a lot is our um, supply and demand um, truckload data and our volumes data. Uh, we measure uh, inbound and outbound freight volumes. Um, we, for, for either on a national level that we looked at here in the, in the presentation today, and we also have that broken down into all 135 different markets so you can understand what is going on in each market. Our data is less than 24 hours old, so what happened, what I'm looking at today, is actually the volumes and the tender rejection rates that happened yesterday in these 135 markets. Uh, we measure, uh, we have a head haul index that helps understand what's going on with capacity in different markets. And we use our uh, outbound tender rejection rates to understand that correlates very closely with what's going on with spot markets, which is really, really important. And with that information, information being less than 24 hours old, that really lets me understand how to bid my freight or understand what's going on also in destination markets. So I would know whether I need to increase my bids or decrease my bids based on um, what's going on in the market. So it's a great platform. Uh, I really would, you know, highly suggest if I go to www.freightways.com. In the center there, you'll see an icon for Sonar. Click on the Sonar icon and scroll down a little bit and you'll see request a demo. Um, you'll be highly impressed with the information that we, that we gather. And it's definitely a tool that can help you increase your um, revenues and also uh, increase your um, awards for bids. Awesome. Thank you for that explanation. One more, uh, oh. one more information. Our data is actually, uh, we have, we have non-disclosure. The data that we receive, uh, most of it is electronically tendered uh, freight loads uh, at the contracted rate level. And using this type of data, I can't tell you who gives us this data, but understanding this data, that's where we get our, I think we have you know, over 85% of the electronic tender loads across the U.S. And this is how we're able to get the information to understand the, the volumes, the tender rejection rates, and of course, capacity. Great. Thank you so much, Donnie. And Doug, over to you. Um, regarding your presentation, is the carrier database prefixed or can a broker add their own carriers? Also, does Transflow manage carrier compliance docs? Say that one more time. I'm sorry. That's okay. Is the carrier database prefixed or can a broker add their own carriers? Also, does Transflow manage carrier compliance docs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in regards, to, I answer the last one first. In regards to carry compliance documentation, we don't handle it. Uh, we do work with the onboarding uh, solutions like RMIS uh, that do handle that. Um, so some good providers out there to do that, to onboard and to ultimately monitor. In regards to how our platform works, uh, we do have a platform that helps with freight visibility, driver engagement, carrier value generation, um, tracking your freight, invoicing. Um, we're not a TMS uh, for that carrier, but we help execute that load. So we're really from low tender all the way through payment. Um, so the way our app works is, you know, we, we already have a whole bunch of drivers on our app as the leading 
um, kind of communication tool uh, within the Class A transportation space. Uh, so those drivers are opened up and we add any new drivers and carriers as well. Each broker that we work with will ultimately uh, give us their list of uh, carriers. We'll be able to add that. If they're already on the platform, it's immediately opened up. If they're not on the platform, uh, which tends to be uh, you know, about 20% of them, uh, which are on the platform, we work uh, to engage them, communicate the value of the platform, and get them onto the platform so that broker gets visibility and starts to provide those tools to uh, both the carrier and their driver. Great, thank you. Um, and next question, you spoke a bit about the 137 driver activities. Can you share a little bit more about what those are? Yeah, so you, you think of a driver and, and what they have to do. And, you know, it, we have an application that anything that has been or, or could be digitized has been, but it's not just driver from point A to, to point B. Um, you know, you have the hours of service uh, regulations, so they have to know how to properly log their time. They have to be able to be at least, you know, somewhat familiar with all uh, the technology of the truck and the trailer so that they're able to do a good uh, pre-trip um, inspection. Um, and be compliant to the mandates of the DOT. Uh, then there's the things that they have to do within the transit of load, such as how do I get into the location I'm going? Um, what is the information about that location? Hours of, of operations? Is there a special code that I need at the gate? Uh, what's the process in detention? So your driver is ultimately that front line when it comes to the detention process, interacting with their lumpers. Um, and then once they get out of that, that shipper, um, they're in transit. They have to determine how they fuel within compliance at the cheapest cost. Where are they gonna rest for that night? Um, how do they weigh their trucks? Where do they weigh their trucks? You know, when they're dealing with a DOT, um, you know, bypass or, or, or scale house, how do they work through that? Is there technology out there that will help them pass that? Um, so that they're not continuing to get inspected. Um, but there's a, a bunch of things. Um, and then there's the paperwork aspect of that, right? So as they're doing this load and executing this load, they're receiving paperwork. How do they get that back to their home office? Uh, what information do they need to provide the carrier off of it? When? Um, one of the things that we think is hugely you know, valuable to the brokers that we deal with is that we give early POD um, information. So in a case where a broker is ultimately flat rated a carrier and the carrier can only submit the flat rate bill, that POD becomes very valuable to that broker in their you know, speediness of uh, billing their, their shipper. Uh, so ultimately, as soon as POD is taken through our application, the broker can receive early access to that, immediately turn around and, and bill um, their shipper. So cash flow is, is a big issue for brokers, especially for carriers and for drivers themselves. Anything we can do to reduce DSOs is something we aim to do. So um, if somebody is interested in you know, kind of getting a complete list, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or uh, my email and, and, and I'll kind of get you that list. Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, another one for you. What are the gaps in functionality given today's available technology in SaaS and inter enterprise TMS solutions that Transflow and other industry participants are addressing, whether organically or inorganically? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's, there's several gaps uh, that, that we identify, you know, and I think there's another question in regards to, to fraud within the broker space. Um, you know, that's a big piece too. So when cash flow is so important, especially to the small carriers, um, how do you get them advances? And if you're going to provide them advances as a broker, how do you ensure that that advance um, is given in a way that you're not going to be subject to fraud? So there's that opportunity there um, that somebody, you know, can come in and, and help with. I think smart detention is something that there's several providers, including Transfield, that have worked to resolve some of these problems, but 
Uh, smart detention um, is something as well. The amount of time that a carrier broker and shipper all spend in auditing and validating detention, um, that whole process can be done. Um, with technology through platforms and, and ultimately help everybody within the supply chain reduce the cost. Um, there's a lot more um, that we're, we're seeing. Uh, communication is, is a key piece too. Uh, if a driver has a question, uh, how fast can you reply to that question? And who actually has that answer? And a lot of times it is very interesting is in the fact that you know, the question is already in somebody's TMS system, whether that's the shipper's TMS system, the broker's TMS system, the carrier's TMS system, but has not been carried out and given to that driver. That lack of information frequently will cause you uh, delay and, and significant costs within any supply chain. Great, thank you, Doug. And a question for Donnie. Um, how does your sonar data and information compare with the use of a rating tool? All right, so I kind of mentioned you know, you're using sonar. Our data is normally less than 24 hours old. Now, when you're using a rating tool, of course, you go in, you tap in the uh, pickup location, you tap in the pickup destination, and it gives you a rate per mile. And it says right there, you can look at a lot of them right below. This is the average rate per mile in the last seven days or maybe the last 15 days. And when you're using a rating tool, your rating tools are normally seven to 10 days old on the information. And the reason that is, is because, you know, when you go in and you actually use a rating tool to book a load, you know, the load may pick up tomorrow. It may take a few days for the load to actually run. Uh, the load may deliver the next day. It takes about a day for the driver to send his bills in, whether he, he uh, sends them in electronically or actually has to mail them. And then, of course, the data company has to, to go through and collect that data from the carriers. And then they need a large enough sample size to actually get an accurate rate per mile for that lane. And that takes a little bit of time. So a lot of your a lot of your rating tools are about seven to ten days behind. Now we're measuring tender rejection rates, and we're looking at you know the uh, our tender rejection rates uh, correlate very very closely with the uh, ups and downs uh, in the spot markets, which we saw when I was comparing the uh, that average rates to our tender rejection rates. And our information is 24 hours less than 24 hours old. So when you're looking at a rate and you're using your rating tool, we can actually see areas where times that our tender rejection rates have jumped up. And that's because the spot market rates have actually moved up in that market. And you're actually pricing freight seven days behind, which can cause you uh, to uh, underbid the load. Or if it's, you know, like after the first year when uh, loads, uh, spot market rates tend to drop through January, you might be overbidding your freight. And because in the last seven to 10 days, the rates have really dropped. So using our platform, especially outbound tender rejection rates, it's something I absolutely love. It's a great tool. And that's what I wish I could have used over the years as a broker. It's my favorite tool. And that really lets me know the trends, the changes, and the direction of the spot markets in the last 24 hours. So when I use the rating tool with it, I may know to either increase my rates or decrease my rates based on the last seven to 10 days. And that's where I can get a lot of value out of this software. Awesome. Thanks, Donnie. Um, and back to you, Doug. Um, specifically regarding California and the upcoming AB5 bill, which will be going into effect in January, do you have any insight on how that bill is going to be affecting the broker market in California and what that really means for them? Yeah, I don't personally. Um, you know, so that would be something you come uh, see us at Freight Waves. Uh, my VP of supply chain would have a lot more information on that. Okay, great. Um, and then next question for you. It sounds like there's still a need for more brokers in the industry. Do you have any tips for those listening in for where to get started in launching a successful brokerage to help shippers move their freight? Yeah, um, you know, so absolutely. Uh, I think your first choice as you're looking at any business is, is looking back at those internal battles, right? Um, so if you're capable of getting, you know, the right people, uh, you know, pay attention to your process and understand what your process needs to be. And then finding the providers out there, uh, there's a, a lot of information there. I think TIA as an organization does an awesome job uh, promoting new brokers into the market and providing the tools necessary to get started. So if you are looking for a resource on kind of step-by-step -step how to start a broker, you know, how to get certified, you know, uh, what technology is available to you, 
I do think that TIA is a great source for that information. All right, great. Um, and next question for you, Doug. Is there any significant, have there been any significant advances in shipper searching by using high-tech tools? I, I don't quite understand what uh, shipper, and, uh, shipper searching means. Um, if that's identifying people that are going to, to uh, ship and have loads available. So, um, you know, there is definitely a lot of opportunity there. A lot of these shippers, uh, once you become a qualified broker for them, uh, they have uh, definitely opened more of a marketplace and you have more visibility to the supply chain. Um, some of that does take integrations and, and understanding of how to get connected to that system. Um, that is something that I think some of the great TMSs out there uh, do for their providers. Uh, we, we don't currently do that. We're not a TMS. Uh, from that standpoint, but definitely would want to understand more about that that area and how we could help. Okay, great. And the person that asked that question clarified um, as far as shipper searching, just meaning locating new shippers to do business with. Okay. Yeah, so um, I am not familiar with um, a tool right now that will do that um, outside of, you know, once you've already booked and provided APIs. Um, but yeah, I'm sure somebody might have one or uh, there's another startup that may come into industry that attacks that. Okay, perfect. Um, and then also, Doug, are you able to comment on the perception that shipper to carrier apps may erode the need for a broker? Yeah, um, I mean, I think each shipper um, has a, a determination that they'll have to handle with their supply chain. Um, and, you know, a lot of shippers are not going to go and spin up and, and go with a broker. Uh, they also don't want to, and I've been at several large ones uh, recently, um, they don't want to manage, you know, a thousand uh, carriers. So being able to have, you know, 100 primary carriers and 50 brokers and those are the 150 relationships that they have to manage that's already a daunting task and then when you bring in you know a tool directly to those carriers is there a benefit there that would reduce their supply cost potentially but you know what's the headaches associated with it and what's the hidden costs so i do think a lot of people are concerned and and, and worried about that as well Okay, great. And we actually just had a question come through about what Velocity Plus means on the little tank image that you have on the slide here. Yeah, perfect. So uh, Velocity Plus is our broker-based platform. Um, you know, so we started about eight years ago with a product that was called Velocity. And Velocity was originally about getting paperwork from the carriers directly into the broker auditing that paperwork so that it was validated and perceived ready to go and, and, and the, the broker ultimately could auto process that. Velocity Plus is essentially the expansion of that platform. So the platform originally dealt with a lot of scanning and validation and auditing. Uh, now it deals with live visibility and it's brought the full power of Transform Mobile Plus into the ecosystem for the broker. So the broker, when they use our platform there, they're ultimately providing their small carriers uh, application uh, that brings huge value um, in, in the day-to-day -day operation of that carrier. Okay, great. Um, and with your data, um, the user asks, will Transflow be transitioning into offering freight matching? Is that something you guys are looking at in the future or no? I don't want to say that we'll, we'll not uh, do freight matching. We don't do freight matching today. Um, there's a lot of providers out there today that do freight matching that would integrate into or could integrate into the front of our system. Um, uh, or we may choose to do it ourselves. Uh, what we do do um, and, and what you know, Transflow has pride itself on is listening to our customers. 
So if our customers say, hey, I, there's not a solution out here that meets my need. I need something that does freight matching. Um, here's what we want it to look like. Without a shadow of doubt, we will build that, that solution. Um, so it has came up. Um, it, it's just not been a strong enough request yet that we're actively building freight matching. Okay, great. And then I think we've got one more that will be a good one to kind of wrap us up today. So you mentioned a lot about battlegrounds to focus on winning the war. Does Transflow offer solutions and services that can help a smaller brokerage address each of the points in your presentation? Or can you point me in a good direction to do more research and help me win the war? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Transflow is definitely a, a key provider uh, to brokers of any size. Uh, we have over 300 brokers that use our platform today, continues to grow. Um, so uh, we can handle a lot of the components with the battlegrounds. We also have great partners that work with us uh, that if you're looking for a resolution um, that or a solution that we don't provide and that we're not going to actively provide in the near future, we generally have a partner there that can help you um, and we can make the introduction and, and get you going with them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, everyone, that is all that we have for today. So thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen in. Thank you to Transflow for partnering with us on today's presentation and also to Doug and Donnie for sharing your insights with us today. Just a quick plug, I'd like to remind all of you on the line that it is not too late to register for our FreightWaves Live event, which is going to be taking place in Chicago next Tuesday and Wednesday, November 12th and 13th. Tickets are on sale at full price for $24.95, but for those of you listening in, we are excited to extend a special offer of $11.95 per ticket, courtesy of our friends at Transflow. That price includes access to all that the event has to offer, including two, including two action-packed days, complete with a keynote discussion with the Wolf of Wall Street, Mr. Jordan Belfort himself, as well as 52 live product demos and so much more. If you're interested, please visit FreightWavesLive.com, click to purchase your ticket, and you can enter promo code TRANSFLOWWEB, T-R-A-N-S-F-L-O-W-E-B, to lock in your rate. We'll also be sending the recording of this webinar out in case you have not had time to write that down um, to make sure that you get to take advantage of that. We appreciate you being here this afternoon and hope you will join us for another webinar again soon. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, guys.